So, the parshas, parshas Itzavim, which we, we will be reading by Hashem tomorrow morning, together with Vayelach, parshas Itzavim talks about a mitzvah. It's very, it's a very controversial amongst uh, the Rishonim what exactly this mitzvah is, but there are. Seen from Rashi, other Rishonim learn that this is about the mitzvah of Torah, the mitzvah of learning Torah, the mitzvah of following the Torah. Others who learn it's about tshuva. So really, on any level, this message is a profound message. It's hard to imagine anything more important at this particular time than to internalize this particular concept that Torah is telling us, because Torah speaks really to a lot of a lot of the mentalities you hear and we hear. Uh, Nowadays, it's very, very common to hear when, a, when you talk to a, sometimes adults, sometimes teenagers, uh, you talk to them about the mitzvah of learning Torah, this incredibly important mitzvah of learning Torah. And the common refrain you get from so many people, are by Sai, amazingly, even ninth graders. There are ninth graders, I'm not sure, hopefully they're not any, uh, none of them are in this room, but there are ninth graders that I've met over the years, and plenty of them, that are convinced already I cannot learn. It's just not for me. Gemara is too hard. It's too esoteric. It's too complicated. I don't see the relevance. All types of, of arguments and rationalizations of why Torah is not for me. I'm a good Jew. I like, uh, I like the mitzvahs. But I just can't handle this Gemara thing. Which, quite frankly, is the essence of Torah. It's a Torah Shabbat Peh. And immersing yourself in Torah and we'll have other times and other opportunities to talk about that is really the essence of Talmud Torah. And I know there are a lot of people who feel, well, I love Navi, and I love Chumash, or I love uh, Halach, I love Ashkafa, and, that, and all that's wonderful. When you talk about delving into Torah and the concept of truly learning Torah, that comes in, in Torah Shabbat Peh, which is, which is Gemara. And the Torah reminds us, HaKadosh Baruch is saying to, to all of us, he says, I want you to know that there might be an attitude among some of you that this is just too difficult. And I'm telling you, it's not far away. It's not Loba Shemayimi. It's not in the heavens. And Rashi amazingly says, if it was in the heavens, if Torah would be in the heavens, you'd have to go get it. You'd have to go find a way. I always thought to me and to myself that when I saw this puzzle, I said, the Torah is predicting air travel. The Torah is telling you that there is a way you can get to the heavens to get the Torah if I put it there. How am I going to get to the heavens? And Rashi says, had I put it in the heavens, you'd have an obligation. How am I going to get there? <laughs> Very, now we're, we're, uh, we're roaming the heavens, we're, hoping, we're roaming the stars, we've got, uh, we got the, the, the aircraft going to Jupiter, we've got the, who knows what we've got going on out there in the sky. We can go everywhere. And 3,000 years ago, the Torah is telling you, if I put it into the heavens, you could have gotten it. But I didn't do that for you. Lo me'e I didn't put it on the other side of the river, on the other side of the ocean. I'm not asking to find this, to, to make a huge uh, cruise liner that's going to be able to travel thousands of miles to the other side of the, to the ocean. How, that's that's going to be tough. If I would put it there, you could do it. Rashi makes the same point. I didn't do that. I didn't make it hard for you. I could have. If I made it hard, you would have been able to do it. But I didn't do that. I'm telling you, says to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Yisrael, it's right there, it's close to you. It's in your hearts. You, all you need to do is grab it. All you need to do is, is, is put in the effort. All you need to do is have that, that inner sense of confidence and that energy and that devotion to, to go for it and to jump into it and to learn. That's all you need. Everybody say the, the message is very, very clear. HaGash Baruch we've, we've already spoken about and, and, and talked about the concept of how much power we have. But HaGash Baruch is also telling us, yes, we have the power to be able to do incredible things. And because Baruch Hu would make us schlep all the way into the heavens, into the other side of the river, we could do it. We'd find a way. There are amazing things we have already accomplished in our, in our lives, in our history, that are, that are mind-boggling. 
But Gash Baruch says, I just want you to know I didn't do that. I didn't make it so difficult for you. All I need from you is that desire and that, and, and that willpower. And how many times have we seen it, Rabbi say? I've said it so many times, young men who have, been, have spent years in this amazing place and in other amazing yeshivas and other high schools throughout the country. And when they're in the high, when they're in the high school, they, they just, it's so hard, it's so hard, it's so hard. They get to Eretz Yisrael. And what happens? Within sometimes days, for sure months, what, they're learning and they're staging and they're, they're involved. And I just got a call from somebody who, uh, uh, I, I just spoke to a mother yesterday from a, who was a kid in Eretz Yisrael. He's in the top, they put him into the top shiva, very top yeshiva. And it doesn't shock me, but it isn't like he was automatically on that level when he left here. But he put him right, when you want it, when you want something, you, you have that inner drive to make it happen. What seems to be insurmountable, Rabbi Yisai, it's you don't have to build a spaceship. It's b'vicha b'vavcha asoso, you can't do it. It's an incredible Gemara, famous Gemara, and you, literally this message, you see it all the time. But Eliyahu Navi meets a fisherman. Eliyahu Navi starts talking to the fisherman, having a conversation, the fisherman says something a little bit disrespectful, so it's sort of Eliyahu Navi, you want to give him a little message. And he says to the fisherman, tell me, do you learn Torah? Fisherman. Nice, simple guy. He says, no, he doesn't know. He's talking to Elio and Navi. He thinks, he thinks he's talking to just a regular Jew. No, I don't learn Torah. It's not for me. It's too hard. Boy, if I had a dollar for every person who said it's too hard. It's too hard. I can't learn Torah. Oh, really? Okay. I hear. So what do you do? I said, I'm, I'm a fisherman. Oh, you're a fisherman. So tell me, what, what is it, what's involved? I mean, you just go out there and just throw a, some, put a, some cheese on a line and some bread and you throw it out into the water and like, I think it's... It's no big deal, right? It's, not, it's quite, actually, being a fisherman is quite complicated. Because you have to know exactly when the fish go to the particular places. You need to know where to find, what kind of water to find to catch those fish. You need to know how to make the nets. The nets are very complicated. When you make a net to trap a fish, you need to know exactly how to make those nets. Because if you make them too big or too small, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. And you have to know exactly the psychology of what it is to, to, to trap that fish. It's very complicated. And then Eliyahu he looks at this man, he says, do you hear what you're saying? You can't learn Torah, but you've got all of this scientific knowledge and, and all of the ideas of animal psychology and all this stuff to be able to know exactly how to trap fish, and you're good at it? And you figure that out? How many people in this room you, who, who maybe are thinking to themselves, ah, Gemara is too hard for me. Can I quote you Kobe's statistics for the last 15 years of his? Absolutely. Can I tell you the, the cam engine, the weight of every different type of Lamborghini to Mercedes to BMW from the last 10 years of how it all operates and, and how much injection uh, uh, air you need and all the other powers of pressure of the tires? You need to get a go. Yeah, I can tell you that. Okay, can I talk to you about, I don't know, this one can talk to you about clothing and all types of fashion lines, this one can talk to you about, about spaceships, and this one can talk to you about, uh, uh, about airplanes, you name it. Somebody is passionate about something around in this room, everyone is passionate about something. And for that thing that you're passionate about, we have no problem getting the, the level of intelligence and knowledge and focus and understanding and appreciation that, boy, we can tell you everything. We know that those statistics left and right. How long the Dodge losing losing streak was? We can tell you exactly how long it was. I can tell you what exactly the batting average was during that losing streak. Thank you, but but for some reason when it comes to Torah, that ah, nah. God he didn't give me the head. He didn't give me that uh, the brain power for that. That's what it does. It doesn't get in. No, it's not a good excuse for Baisai. The ficha b'vavchal asoso. HaGosh Baruch Hu told us that we have it. Maybe not everyone's destined to be, and we don't even know that, the truth of the matter is. <laughs> I, I've had guys here, literally, I can tell you, maybe they didn't learn for four years. Maybe that's maybe too strong of a statement, but they learned very, very minimally over four years. I see them 10, 15 years later, and, and also throughout those years. And when they hand you, you feel like you're overwhelmed with emotion. They hand you a safer that they wrote on the laws of Erevin. They wrote a, a, a booklet that's going to be distributed about the laws of sukkah. You have people here who, when they, they, they've written, I mean, literally what, what, what they've accomplished just from, from being in this, these four walls for four years, and they go out and they, they shine. 
And you would have said not possible when they were here. Incredible people doing incredible things, learning on very, very high levels. So how do we write ourselves off? We're 14, 15, 16 years old. We're writing ourselves off? It's ridiculous. It's the ATAR talking to us. Telling us we can't do it. It's a ridiculous notion. And when we do that, everybody said, we're really, we're, we're committing something very, it, it's really not appropriate. When you limit the potential of a Jew, in this week's parsha in Vayelech, we go to the very next parsha, and Moshe Beinu is told by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hein karvu yamech alamus. Hein karvu yamech alamus, this is the last day of Moshe's life. And Hashem is telling him, now it's time, the hours are approaching, the minutes are approaching, it's time to wrap it up. The 120 years are exactly up today, it's Zion Hadar, and you are dying today, Moshe Rabbeinu. Hein korvi yamech alamus, it's right there in the, in the Psukim. And, and the Medrash says, Moshe Rabbeinu comes, calls back to, to HaKadosh Baruch he says, what? Hein korvi yamech alamus? You tell me that I have a few minutes left in the world with the word Hein? The word hain, hain karvi mechli lomus, that's not the right word to use to tell me I'm going to die today. I use that word hain in a beautiful way. I said some, some power shows back in the beginning of the Varim, I said hain l'ashem hashemayim v'shmei hashemayim. I use that word hain to praise you God. So why would you use that word hain back in a little bit of a negative way? Will you tell me today I have to die and I use the word hain? To tell it's an unusual word, Hain. The whole Hain is like sort of a sort of a exclamation point. What are you what are you ex, uh, making an exclamation point? Hain Karvimachalamas. Just tell me. Today I have to go. Especially when I use that word Hain in a beautiful way. I use that word Hain to inspire to, to, to inspire the Jewish people to bring them closer to God. Answers are Kurdish Baruch, yes, Moshe Benu. But you use that Hain another time. And only the people who lain will know when did, HaKadosh, when did Moshe use the word hate another time? Back in Shemos. Anybody remember? Moshe Benu said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu a sentence with the word hate. And he said, V'hein lo yaminu bi. He said, you tell, you tell me to go to Egypt and to tell the Jewish people I'm going to take you out of Mitzrayim? V'hein lo yaminu bi. They're not going to believe me. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Moshe Benu, <laughs> Moshe, you have a little bit of a selective memory here. The Hain al Hashem Shemei Hashemayim, you remember. But the Hain Le'aminu, you don't remember. You said words that never should come out of your mouth. Words that, that nobody should ever say about another Jew. And Rabbi say, we that other Jew, about ourselves we should never say it. We have no problem giving other Jews credit. But we have, we have a problem giving ourselves credit. It's so easy. The Leitzar is so good at telling us, nah, come on. This stuff of greatness and spirituality and, and working on, on ourselves and getting close to Gadish Baruch Hu and doing Chuvi before Shishan. Come on, it's for other people. Hey, Le Aminu B, did I? But, I, but I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm stuck in my, my quagmire of, of hypocrisy and, and, and mediocrity. It's a lie. The Yitzhar is very good at convincing us, Rabbi Yisai, I am who I am, I ain't going to change. Because Baruch Hu tells us again and again, and Moshe, ba- Moshe Benu bangs us over the head. Again, you, of course you can change. Of course you can change. You can get close to Gadish Baruch Hu. Somebody can say, I can't stop talking to Rechazos shots. Can you say such a thing? And yes, I've seen people 30, 40 years are still talking during, during Chazar Sashat. They don't shut their mouths. They're inhabiting. What, they can't? Of course they can. What can you say? We can't do it? Of course we can. It might be hard. Of course we can do it. I said a couple of weeks ago, oh, we can't wear tzitzis? I can't. Of course we can't. What, 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 what kind of argument? I can't put the Dotlid conference on my body when I, my hands sort of freeze. The minute I try to put those tzitzis on, my, my hand just sort of, come on. I can't work on my speech. I can't improve my keyboard out of the aim. 
I can't maybe start talking a little bit nicer to my family members? I can't? Or we just find it a little bit hard to get that energy going to be able to do it. And to say I can't learn, it's a lie. It's a lie, Rabbi Say, and it's a lie that's been proven time and time and time again. The most adamant people who would say, I can't learn, and you see them a couple years later, and they're flying like you wouldn't believe. What happened? Injection of brain power? What happened? No. You put the technology a little bit on the side, you try to get to sleep at about 12 o'clock, you don't start looking at things till 3 o'clock in the morning, you don't, you're not worried about all this stuff, you're not gaming and this and internetting and, and then uh, Facebooking and then uh, and, uh, Instagramming and who knows what's going on till for the wee hours in the morning. You put that on the side a little bit, you get some clarity in your brain, you get some sleep at night, you start getting interested. I love that song, it's an old song, I don't know if you guys uh, uh, ever listened to the Journeys albums. The Ninth Man, whoa, it's a great song. It's, what a telling song, okay? What? I, I, I don't have a good voice, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a song about, it's a song about a bunch of rough and tumble guys from, uh, from the, the east side who didn't learn a word, and every Rebbe, they, they went through a Rebbe a, a month, basically, and finally one Rebbe shows up, it's like Omer time, and he shows up, and he's got this... Uh, Attitude, I'm just going to teach. If they're not going to listen and they're throwing spitballs in the places, it is in pandemonium. But hey, I was hired to teach. I'm teaching Torah. But the song goes, but it, it didn't go in. Talak Bomer Day. They have a, a game in the park against the rough and tumble boys from Brooklyn. And uh, they, were, they were the underdogs, and the Brooklyn guys were the favorites, and they're playing this game. And then the catcher breaks his leg, and now they're down one man, and they're about to forfeit. And he says, Well, the rabbi opened up the rabbi, he says, Well, wait a minute. No forfeit, I can play. I'm still, I'm on the team. I'm on, I'm on from their school. I can play. It's okay. <laughs> he wants to play. Rabbi wants to hit the ball with the baseball bat. Huh? Sure. Let him get up. I don't need any help, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for the message. I got it. So, so the Rebbe, the Rebbe gets up there and uh, as the song goes, he hits a... It's a grand slam in the bottom of the ninth inning or whatever the exact details were and he's carried off on everybody's so shoulders and he's a big hero. And he says, guys, you owe me one. And they owe him one. So one day, the 10th, uh, uh, the 34th day of the Omer, they come to class, we owe the Rebbe, so today no spitballs, no joking around, and no hullabalooing, this, we're just going to... I'm just going to focus. Hey, this man's interesting. He's not, uh, not boring after all. Actually, he has something to say. You know, the Gemara is very exciting. That Kasha, Rashi, uh, Rashi's point with Tosfis and the difference between, oh, there's something there. And from that day on, it was a different classroom. Oh, well, he spoke about, obviously, the Dodgers and everybody else. He also spoke about Rashi and Tosfis. It's amazing how it's all it's all in beficha bevavcha sosra by say. It's all in our hearts and minds to do. And if we say for a second we can't do it, we are guilty of the very same word that Moshe Benu said about Klai Yisrael when he said, "Hey, lo yaminu be Hakadosh Baruch Hu." Forty years later, does not forget a thing. He says, "You dare say about the Jewish people they can't do it? You dare limit somebody's potential?" You dare say that there's a, something that a Jew, if he put their mind to it, can't accomplish? Don't you dare. There are no limitations. You could get to the heavens. You could figure out how to get to the other side of the Pacific Ocean. I'm not making you go there. I'm not making you do this because I'm putting it right in your heart to do. But if, you should know how great you are. If you needed to go, you could get there. But Kosh says, not for Torah. The Torah, it's right here. It's right there. It's what you say. It's in your heart of what you want. What do you really want? Now, Kosh Baruch Hu says during this time, right before Shoshana, I just want your heart. I just want you to be sincere. I just want you to turn to me on Thursday morning. I want you to turn to me with sincerity and, and just 
accept our relationship, uh, accept the fact that we are in this together. And I've got your back and you've got mine and you care about my glory and I care about your well-being. That's all Kosh Baruch Hu asks of us during this time. Now we're in this together. Rabbi said, our history is full of stories and full of situations where Jews who could not, you, you would not say for a second they have any capability of rising to any challenge. And yet they do it. I love sharing the story about the, the Jewish kapo. These collaborators, Nebuch, there were many who decided based on the pressures of the time, it's hard to judge people, but being a collaborator with the Nazis seems like an unaccept, completely unacceptable place for a Jew to be. As, as horrific as, as those times were, how do you do that? And there was a Jew who was in the same concentration cla- uh, camp as the Blue Jeva Rebbe, and his Hasidim was a great tzaddik, and he survived the war with his Hasidim. And they said this amazing story over many eyewitnesses to this story. And the Blue Jerebbe and his Hasidim were, were in this, the horrors of, of, of the concentration camp. And it was right before Yom Kippur, just days approaching. And the Hasidim, and, and to, to even think in these terms is, is miraculous. And they went to the Rebbe and he says, listen, maybe talk to that Jewish kapo, talk to that guy when he gives us to work every single day. He's going to give us work tomorrow, it's going to be Yom Kippur. Maybe you can ask him, he knows the halachas, he knows the laws. Ask him if he can only give us rabbinically prohibited work. We can't ask for a day off, that's too far, too much to ask for. But maybe if he can adjust the workload so we shouldn't break the laws of Yom Kippur. Can you imagine being in a, in a, in a Treblinka, in an Auschwitz, and, uh, just to, to, and, and have this kind of feeling in your heart? And the Rebbe was very nervous. He wasn't sure what kind of reaction was gonna, he was going to evoke from this kapo. You wouldn't give a nickel for his nisham at this point. What is he? He's a collaborator with the Nazis? And sure enough, he goes over to, the, to, this, to this Jew, and he says, you know, tomorrow's Yom Kippur. Can you please maybe adjust the workload? Get out of here. Stop annoying me with your crazy request. Workload, you care about workload, you care about Yom Kippur. Get out of here. And he dismissed the Rebbe. It's a very, very negative experience. The Rebbe went away very dejected. Everybody said, don't ask me what happened between that moment and the next morning. I can't answer you. I could just say this much. When you're talking to a, to a Jew and you have a Yiddish and a Shema, you don't know what's going to spark it. Was it the question of the Rebbe? Was it the way he walked away? Was it the thought afterwards, the reverberations of thought of guilt and pangs of what am I doing with these Nazi collaborators? I don't know. I can't tell you what it was. But I can tell you that the next morning when the Jews showed up for work there, he was giving them work that did not involve any Chil Yom Kippur. And to say, to say the word that, that a Jew could be on cloud nine in a happy state, in a Gehenna like the concentration camps is, is almost an impossibility, but to whatever extent the Jew can feel Simcha, they felt Simcha. And they were singing, whatever they remembered by heart, they had no Mahzarma, of course, they had no Sidurim, but whatever they remembered for the Yom Kippur Davening, they were singing in such euphoria because the, the, our Jewish kapo didn't give us work that made us break the laws of Yom Kippur. Everybody say again, if the story ended here, it would be an amazing story. What makes it an incredibly, overwhelmingly inspiring story is the fact that just a few minutes later, as they're working, and what was normally 300 calories a day was a typical ration for a Jew in the concentration camps. That's not a lot. It's about one candy bar all day. And the doors open wide and the Nazis, Yamach Shemam Zichram, roll out a Viennese table with gorgeous delicacies and says, Jews, you're eating today. Because they knew that would be causing the most pain to those Jews, to have to eat. Even though they were desperately hungry, it was Yom Kippur. And what they saw next, they could not believe. They would not have predicted it, not in a thousand years. And this Jewish collaborator walks over to the to the head commandant of that particular group, and he says, no, you don't understand. It's Yom Kippur, it's our holiest day, we're not eating today. 
The Nazi had, almost fell over laughing. You're, you're talking to me about Yom Kippur? You're a collaborator. You're one of us. What are you? What are you? Your hands are, are sullied. You're nothing. Of course they're reading today. You'll do what I tell you to do. And he repeated those words. It's our holiest day. We won't eat today. The Nazi takes his gun out and points it at the forehead of that Jew and he says, Jew, you're eating and they're eating today. Or it's going to be the last thing that you don't do. And looking down the barrel of a gun, he repeats those words. It's our holiest day. We're not eating. And with those words, he died out the Kiddush Hashem in front of the Rebbe, in front of his Hasidim. They could not believe what they saw. I can't do it. When a guy who yesterday was a collaborator and today is ready to give his life, Api Kiddush Hashem, that we can't do it? Do we have any idea of who we are and what we have within us? We don't want to be criticized by everybody at the end of our lives. You said those words back when you were 14 or 15 or 22 or 30. You said, ah, hey, like I mean to be, talking about ourselves, ah, I'm not good enough, I can't do it. I don't have the power, I don't have the brain power. I wasn't born to be a learner. I wasn't born to be a, anybody special. Moshe had to pay a price. His, his deli- the words that delivered the message that you're dying today was that word hain. Kakosh Baruch says, you never talk like that. Not about my people. Not about the Jewish people. Especially not about ourselves. Because we don't even, we can't even imagine what we can tap into, Rabbi Isai. So if we Really think about this. If it's b'fichah b'vavchal asos, whether you learn the mitzvahs Torah, whether you learn the mitzvahs tshuva, no matter how you learn that pasuk, we can do that, and we can do this. We can we can do the small step. Rabbi Saul Slanta says when we talk about getting ready for Shoshana and Yom Kippur, it's not about major Baruch Hashem. You guys are amazing. You guys are great. You guys are the future leaders of Klai Yisrael. It's not about making major transformation. We're not going down into, into who knows where in some neighborhood where they don't know a word about Torah or asking a Jew to turn his whole life over. It's not what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants of us. But he does want to see one small step in his direction. One small movement. One small... On a Friday afternoon, can I help? Anything I can do to, to, get, to help you guys get ready for Shabbos? One self-control in the basketball court. One decision to start putting those titus on, on as we get dressed every morning. One decision to say, you know what, I, maybe I won't talk anymore during Chazar shots. Those are not small things, Rabbi Isai. Maybe I'll shut the computer at 11 o'clock and maybe I won't go back to it. And I'll put my phone and disconnect it and put it outside. Because I know what it is when it's right next to me. I know how often I look at it. I don't want to get up in, in the night, the first thing I do. Look at that phone. Anybody try to reach me at 3 a.m.? Well, what am I doing? What am I doing? Who am I living for here? What kind of life do I have? Any one of those small things and, and a thousand others that you can think of maybe better than I can. One, just one small step between now and Rosh Hashanah would be so huge. Such a schus. I both say not just for you. Not just for your families, but every step that a Jew takes is a tremendous schus for all of Kai Yisrael. Let's take that step and be zochah to good gebet shalom. What's that? They train them to they, they train, stand on a peg? No, they have a little coil around its neck and they stick a peg into the ground. And elephants put the oh, to keep the them down. Yeah. yeah. They learn when they're babies, they put that... Oh, so I, right. They can't, and they can't get oh, it. I use that by, uh, by the lion. I just used that two weeks ago. I said that. Oh, that's that's why Rabbi Chait's marshal about the lion. The lion thinks he could get out, yeah, yeah. but he can't. But he doesn't know that he can get out. Yeah. So that's the same bar. Like you're a prisoner of your own. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. yeah. No one's holding you back by yourself. Yeah. So yeah. Ninth, ninth man. The ninth man. A.B. Rottenberg. A.B. Rottenberg. Journey. 
Journeys 3. Journeys 3. I think it's called Ninth Man. It's not on the team. The name of the song on the album is the Ninth Man. I know from that's a, it's the same album as Naraisi, so I know. As Naraisi. Yeah. Yeah, Journeys 3. I mean, you're right. Okay, you're right. That's in Vegas. You're right. What? I just put puts more pressure. I gotta. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I, know I told some people that story. Yeah. What? I I, 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 I didn't tell them, but I uh, I, I said it over. I had, I had him. I could not keep him in class one day. <laughs> one day I couldn't. The guy was off the wall. Yeah. Wall, <laughs> he was shy. So yeah, I should have mentioned that. Probably even Mamish, one of yeah. the most prestigious uh, Absolutely. The, uh, genre that yeah, yeah. exists today. Well, listen, they called the mirror, they called the mirror and they asked, I'm yeah. sure they asked the mirror, who should we go after? You know, it wasn't some... Uh... Oh, Dr. Shiverman in this morning, and Rabbi Sama asked me to ask the mirror, Rabbi Sama, like, what they're doing for Sichel. And one guy said, uh, Yeah, that's fine. I mean, you should say, the guys who are going could say on their own. But in the Shiva Minion, it's probably too hard, so you should try to say Slichas, yeah. I hear, I, well, first of all, it's going to change. You're going to see as you get older, it's going to be less difficult. And you do have, obviously, you know, challenges because everybody's different, you know. But A, I, th- I still think it's doable. And you said, you can, so listen, as far as the shift per se, give it to us like this. If you really see that it's not clicking for you, maybe the pace will go around the ground. Like, until someone's class, I, I actually, I despise more. Like, I can, I can stand on you, but now I do uh, I hear. Yeah, and you will, and you'll see. You'll see. As you get older, it's gonna, this issue is gonna be less of an issue for you. People do not stay. The whole ADHD thing doesn't stay. It, it slowly. I'm medicated for it, but. Right. I, okay, but you know what? Let's see. Maybe, maybe Taka. You know, switching shroom is makes sense. So, we should uh, take a look at it after circus and. Okay.